together. Almighty God, in you are hidden in all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word. And give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Let's welcome Pastor Ben for today's message. Thank you, Song Tiam, for leading us in a time of worship. And now we come to the Lord in worship by looking at His Word. We have been in our, this month of stewardship, this month, this pledge month, we have been looking through a sermon series called the Giving Sermon Series. And this is what we have covered so far. We have looked at how giving helps in growing humility, how giving helps in growing contentment, how giving helps in growing truth, not truth, faith, (laughs) and how giving helps in growing generosity today. And so if you have missed any of these sermons in the past four weeks, you can go to our YouTube channel and you can retrieve the sermon for your own listening in your own time. Today we are looking at how giving helps in growing generosity and we're looking at just one verse. One verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. And so, because there's only one verse, let's all read it together as the people of God, shall we? So, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 11, let's read it together. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, indeed. Today, we are looking at how Giving grows generosity. Giving grows generosity. So three Gs, giving grows generosity. Uh, Those of you who have been to Bangkok would recognize this bridge uh, quite quickly. It is the bridge in front of uh, MBK, Mabung Krong. It's uh, been there for quite a while and it's quite iconic. For a long time, the bridge had been... um, filled with a number of beggars, even up to the early 2000s. Uh, there would be beggars uh, on the bridge, uh, seated there. Uh, sometimes, some of them uh, are handicapped. They do not have hands or do not have legs. And they'd be seated there, um, begging. When I was sent there for work, when I was still in Hewlett Packard in the early 2000s, uh, there was once I was walking across the bridge, Uh, That's never happened to me before, but as I was walking across the bridge that evening, uh, as I walked past one beggar, I felt a voice in my heart saying, why aren't you giving to him? Why aren't you giving to him? And I felt this tug in my heart, and I didn't know what to feel about it. I know I ought to give, but I just can't bring myself to give. And so I walked past the beggar. About 15 steps down the overhead bridge, now I come across another beggar. And I told myself, now I will give. And so I took out 200 baht, I put it in my pocket. As I got, as I got ready to walk past him, I thought to myself, okay, I'll hold on to the 200, dollars, 200 baht, and as I walk past the beggar, I'll just put it in and I'll go. And as I walked past the beggar with the 200 baht in my pocket and in my hand, I just walked past the beggar without giving to the second beggar. And I thought to myself, why? Why can't I be generous? What am I concerned about? Is it because I'm, I think somebody else ought to, ought to help the beggar? Is it because I'm thinking uh, maybe the beggar is part of a syndicate and if I give to him, it will perpetuate this uh, syndicate of beggars going on and all that? But I can't help but feel in my heart there's something wrong with me not being able to give to someone who is clearly perhaps in need. And then I resolved in myself that if I come across a third beggar, I would really give to the third beggar. And as I walk, Another 15 steps down the road, came to another beggar, and finally I took out the 200 baht, 200 baht from my hand, and I quickly put it into the basket that was there, and I quickly walked away. But all the while in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, even as I walked away, there's still something wrong with me. Why is it that I cannot be 
generous. Even if this beggar was part of a syndicate and, you know, it will perpetuate this uh, secret society of uh, people who are using beggars to generate income, wouldn't I have helped this beggar at least for that day? The very fact that he or she can uh, accumulate the quota for that day would mean that perhaps he would not be beaten up by the syndicate for that day. And I would have helped him already in one way or another. Why is it that I cannot be more generous? What's keeping me from being generous? And sometimes we face those questions in our own lives, isn't it? We are faced with situations that we see, hey, we ought to give. But somehow we may be reluctant in one way or another to give. Perhaps it's concern about it's some concerns about us having not enough, whether it's for now or for our futures. Perhaps it stems from concerns of I need to save for a rainy day, I'll never know what will happen. Right? We need to save for rainy days. Perhaps it's concerns about how if we do not have enough, we will end up needing help from others ourselves and we will inconvenience others and perhaps that's not good as well. All these concerns, at the end of the day, boils down to, I think, two things. That we find it hard to place our trust in anything else other than what we already have for ourselves or what we can earn for ourselves. We find it hard to place our trust in any other thing other than what we already have for ourselves and what we can earn for ourselves. And that is why today we are talking about how giving helps to grow generosity and why it is helpful for us and for others, for us to give and to be generous. And we'll be looking through the sermon using these four questions. What is generosity? Why should I be generous? Why giving itself grows generosity? And then how should I give? How should I give? What is generosity? Well, generosity is the, it's being willing to give sacrificially for the sake of others. Uh, we know this implicitly, actually. Um, imagine with me if a man who is very rich and he gives uh, $100 to someone, to help the someone, compared to someone who is very poor and gives, again, $100 to help someone who is in need. Who is more generous? We implicitly know, right, that it's the person who is poor and yet is willing to give sacrificially for others. We implicitly understand the meaning of generous being a characteristic of one who is being willing to give sacrificially for the sake of others. And we see that in the nature of God. The Father in heaven gave sacrificially. He gave of His own Son for us. He gave sacrificially for us. The Son Himself, Jesus, gave of His own life sacrificially for us. It caused them much to give. It caused God much to give to us and for us. And so we hear of the story of Jesus seeing a poor old lady giving two coins uh, to uh, the synagogue or to the temple. And this uh, to the synagogue. And Jesus commended this poor lady of giving the two coins. And he said, she has given much. Why? Because she was poor. And out of all that she had, she gave two coins to the synagogue. It cost her much. It cost her sacrifice to give. She was sacrificially giving. And in that, she was being generous. Generosity is being willing to give sacrificially for the sake of others. And the question that sometimes I ask myself, am I giving sacrificially? Or am I giving only out of what I already have much and therefore the little that I give, it didn't cost me much. And I don't even feel a tug in my heart. I don't even feel a pinch in my heart even as I give. Have I given sacrificially? Am I generous? But why? Why should I be generous? Because in being generous, we learn to love our neighbours. 
generosity turns our attention from ourselves, from ourselves being our own idol, what we need, uh, what satisfies us, what will give us enjoyment, to then now be able to turn our attention to others. What do others need? What will fulfill the needs of others? What do others require for their livelihood and for their lives? Generosity turns the attention from us being our own idols to the needs of others. And we begin to learn to love our neighbours. We begin to be able to live out what it means to not love ourselves, but to love our neighbours more and more. And that can be seen from a story that Jesus told. We read from Luke chapter 10 that there was a lawyer who came to Jesus and tried to put Jesus to the test. He said to him, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the teacher answered, The lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. And so Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And so we were told thereafter that this lawyer tried to justify himself and he asked Jesus, Jesus, then who is my neighbour? And Jesus then began to tell him a story or a parable to explain. Jesus talked about how now there was a man who was injured on the road and there along came by a Levite. A Levite is like a priest, a pastor like me, right? A religious man. And this Levite came along and, uh, and saw this man who was injured and needed care. And this Levite went, mm-hmm. walked by the side and skirted around the man and went off on his own. And then Jesus talked about how another, uh, likely to be a leader of uh, a religious leader, came along, again saw that man who was injured and this religious leader went by the other way around the man and skirted along by the side and left the man there uh, injured. And then Jesus began to say, but there was a Samaritan. A Samaritan is someone who is different from the Jew who was injured, the man who was injured. Uh, perhaps even seen as someone who is not just different, but had differences with the Jews. And But a Samaritan, Jesus said, a Samaritan came. And as he journeyed, he came to where the man was. And when he saw him, this Samaritan had compassion. This Samaritan cared for this man who was injured. And he went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Of course, Jesus was trying to explain to the teacher, uh, to the lawyer, how someone who could be different from them or from us Someone could even have differences from us, or even our enemies, and that someone is still our neighbour. But what I want us to see today is to see the generosity of the Samaritan in his giving, in his caring for someone who is different from him, from someone who perhaps even had differences with him. And so we see here that this Samaritan had compassion, and then he cared for him. He set this man on his own animal, which meant he had to make sacrifices. He had to inconvenience himself. Because what now that man was that, with the man on the animal, he himself would have to walk. He himself would no longer be able to sit on an animal. He himself would have to walk. And so he walked, he made sacrifices, he inconvenienced himself to be able to care for someone else. And he took him and brought him to the inn and took care of him. I can imagine, right, that perhaps... This uh, Samaritan could have gone to the innkeeper and said, okay, you take care of him. Now that I brought him here already, I'll give you the money, you just take care of him. But he took care of him himself. There was ownership in caring for this man. He owned the caring of the man for himself. And then not only that, the next day he took out two denarii, he gave it to the innkeeper and he said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, And whatever more you spend, I will repay you, he said. There was a sense of generosity 
from this Samaritan. Any more you spend, I will repay you. I can imagine the innkeeper saying, hmm, any more I spend. Okay, if I need to bring this uh, man to a private doctor, I can do so. If I need to send him for a CT scan, I can also do so. If I need to give him the best medicine, I can do so. If I need to send him then to a physiotherapy, I can also do so. Okay, I exaggerate. There probably won't, there definitely wasn't any CT scan at the point in time. But you get my drift, right? He was being generous such that the best care can be given to this man who was injured. But not only that, he went on to say, I will repay you when I come back. That is a pledge. A pledge of future giving back to the innkeeper. A pledge of faith. In whatever the innkeeper spends, I will repay back. I will give back whatever you spend to take care of this man. There's a pledge of giving for a future, for the future, whatever you spend. And so this man, this Samaritan, was being generous. He was willing to make sacrifices, inconvenience himself. He owned the care for the man. He was generous in how he was willing to give freely. And he even pledged a future giving to care and to love this neighbour. And Jesus said, that is loving the neighbour. By being generous, by being willing to give, not just now and perhaps a pledge for the future, we are learning to love our neighbours. We are learning to love our neighbours as we give. But how does giving itself grow generosity? Well, I offer a few reasons here. I'm sure there are more reasons why giving actually helps to grow our generosity. But let me just go through a few. Firstly, it subverts the nature of money. Because you see, Jesus himself said that man cannot serve two masters, God and mammon, God and money. There's a sense that money itself has a hold over man such that, you know, if we serve money, we will end up not being able to serve God. It has a certain control, even a spiritual control over perhaps men. And so Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. It's either God or money. And now, if we were to end up serving money, and money itself therefore has a sense of control over men, we will not be able to submit ourselves to God. The origin of the word money comes from the word moneta in Latin. It's the name of a temple, a Roman temple, and Roman coins were minted in this Roman temple. And they would use these Roman coins to uh, grow the Roman Empire in the uh, gaining of property, of slaves, of animals. And so there's a sense that at the start of how the word money came about, it was used for accumulation. It was used for self-gain. And now it was used for enrichment of the, na- of, the, of the empire and enrichment of the self. And so if we now turn it around and use money to give, if we now turn it around and to use money to enrich others, we are turning it around for the use of the kingdom of God rather than to use it to enrich ourselves. We begin to use money to enrich others. And we subvert the whole of money that it has over us. Because now, rather than holding on to the money that has got control over us, we are willing to give it away to enrich others instead. We are now using it to enrich others and to extend the kingdom of God. And so you see in our church, we regularly cite examples of how we have been giving, right, as a church, to those poor and needy in Topayo community. In the Topayo community, uh, we would give out of our financial assistance to those families who are poor so that we can, in a sense, enrich them, help them to grow uh, in the way in which they can manage their money, they can overcome the debts that they have so that their families, the struggles of the family can be overcome. We use finances that all of you have generously given to also help those in the field so that they also... Uh, are able to um, be provided for uh, and provide for their children so that growing up, 
their livelihoods can also be taken care of and their place in society can also uh, be enriched and to grow. And so we are turning the subversive nature of money around from how money has got control over ourselves to now use it for the kingdom of God, helping to then release the control of money over our lives and to then give it for others. How does giving help to grow generosity? It also makes us more Christ-like. When we become more Christ-like, and we said it earlier, that the nature of God is a self-giving God, self-giving sacrificially, and when we are generous and when we start giving, we begin to sense that you know, we are right with God, we are more and more Christ-like, and that gives us the satisfaction of our growth and uh, our, our growing to be more and more Christ-like, to be more and more how Christ himself gives of himself to others. And we want to do it more and more. It is like how my daughter uh, wasn't very good in math for a while. Uh, and as uh, we spent time with her, helping her to uh, be able to learn how to do the math better, uh, she gains confidence from it. And because she gains confidence from it, she wants to do it more and more, and she enjoys the subject more and more. And so it's like this, right? Sometimes we uh, don't think we are very Christ-like, but as we practice what it means to be Christ-like, we realize that, hey, it gives, it's giving us a sense of growth. It's giving us a sense of, set of satisfaction. That we, become, we are becoming more and more like Christ, and we want to do it more and more because it is in line with God's will, and that's how we become more and more generous even as we give. It, becomes, it makes us more Christ-like. And becoming more Christ-like helps us to want to do it more and therefore helps us to grow in generosity. Giving helps us to grow in generosity also because it makes us more joyous. When we see the joy of others when we are blessed, it makes us realize that bringing joy to others can be joyous to ourselves, even more so than the enjoyment of self. I remember going to um, U.S. once and, uh, in California, and I was at this uh, very nice place called Yosemite National Park, and I saw the valley where it was snow-covered and all, and I felt like, wow, I was enjoying the view very much. At a point in time, I also thought how nice it would have been if my wife was with me and she could enjoy uh, the view as well. A number of years later, I managed to, together with her and my young son, go to the same place in Yosemite, and I showed her, it is what I've been wanting to show you, this nice, wonderful view. And when she saw it, I could see her delight in the, on the delight on her face. Wow, that's so wonderful. And I felt pleased, I felt joyous that I could share that sense of joy together with her. And so it's like this, when we begin to give, and we see the joys... And, uh, and, 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 and the happiness on the faces of others when we bless them. And it makes us feel like, wow, oh, we've done something right. It makes us feel like we have done something good and it makes us joyous in our spirit. And that motivates us to want to continue to give and therefore grow in generosity. When we give, it also helps in our future giving in being more generous in the future. Why? Because can you imagine with me, if one day, you know, we have, not, we have not been giving all this while, and one day, you know, we are challenged to give, and we have to give 10% of our income, and maybe our income was $10,000 at a point in time, and we'll give $1,000, that's a lot of money from $0 to $1,000 giving regularly. But if someone, in a child, for example, like a child, uh, has been practicing giving since young, perhaps 10 cents every Sunday, and then growing to $1 every Sunday, $10 every Sunday, $100 when, when he starts earning, then giving $200, $500, $1,000. is not that difficult after all? Because that practice of giving has been ingrained in this person's life. And therefore, giving isn't difficult. And that helps when we are training our children from young to be able to give it helps them to be generous more and more later on in life. It helps in future giving. Giving grows generosity because it also inspires others to be generous with their lives. 
we've been hearing about how our young leaders, having seen our, their, see, their uh, previous leaders in the youth ministry giving generously uh, to uh, the youth, whether in treating them to uh, see movies or paying for meals and all that. And that's inspired now this generation of youth leaders to be generous to our current youth. And so the generosity of our previous youth leaders has inspired this generation of current youth leaders to also be generous in their own lives. And that's how giving helps to grow generosity, not just in ourselves, but in others as well. When we train ourselves to be generous, it only helps us, but it helps others. So for example, two of our seniors, one is homebound, and recently one of our pastors visited her, and she knew that it was pledge month, and she was so eager to give, and she said, Pastor, Pastor, please help me to give this pledge uh, to the church. And she even asked, is it enough? Is it enough? And that has inspired us, perhaps me, even in my old age, even if I cannot come to church, to still be able to give. Another of our seniors, uh, she has been traveling to visit her children overseas, and she said that she purposely flew back to Singapore so that she can give of her pledge to the church this month, just so that she can give. She has been giving, of course, for many years, and that... uh, now, it's a practice that she has been practicing, uh, and now she continues to give, even while away, purposely coming back to give. And that inspires us as well. Finally, how does giving grow generosity? By giving generously, you are already practicing generosity, and that has already helped you to grow in generosity. Isn't it? Imagine you've never given before generously and today you give generously, you're willing to pledge generously and that's already helped you in your practice of giving generously to grow in generosity. And so giving grows generosity in us. Then how? How then should I give? And these are principles that was laid out in our pledge letter that was sent to all of our church members. How, does, how do we give? And what are principles do we follow? Firstly, let us remember that God loves us regardless. Regardless of how much or how little we give, God loves us, period. God's love for us is not determined by what we can do for Him, but what He has already done for us, right? He gave His Son for us already. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He loves us, period. No matter how much or how little we can give. Secondly, God knows our hearts and where we stand financially. And from where we stand, God desires for us to give cheerfully, as 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 puts it. And so for those who perhaps are in lack this year, in one way or another, for one reason or another, and are unable to give as much as previous years, don't be saddened because God knows your situation. God knows you. God knows where you are. And regardless of how much you give, God loves you, so you can give cheerfully whatever you can, so that what you have, you are still able to care and take care. You can, you are still able to take care of your family and provide for your family and other obligations. But at the same time, for those who are not in lack and are financially secure, perhaps this year is a year where we can give more to cheerfully cover for those who cannot give as much this year. This is what the early church did, right? They sold off their possessions. They gave of what they have so that others who do not have could be cared for as well. And then thirdly, whether we give little or we give much, let us be assured that God provides for us all. He's able to make His grace abound in, all, in us so that in all sufficiency, in all things at all times, we may abound in every good work, as 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 tells us again. God has promised that He will pour out His grace so that we may be sufficient. Not in some things, but in all things. Not at some times, but at all times. And continue to abound in every good work so that we are able to still bless, to still give, to still good work, to still do good work for His glory. And this assurance is for all of us that even as we give, God, by His grace, will ensure that whether we as individuals, even as we give, 
that we will be provided for. At the same time, the church will be provided for as well because God makes His sufficiency enough for the church as well. And therefore, so how should I give? Give knowing that God loves us. And so we can give in faith. Give knowing that God knows us, whether we have little or we have much, and so we can give cheerfully what God has put in our hearts to give. How should I give? We can give in such a way that we know that God provides for us. And because we know God provides for us, we can give generously. We can give generously. So let us give because giving grows generosity. We have looked at how giving helps us to grow in humility, contentment, faith, and generosity. And all these are hallmarks, all these are qualities of what it means to be disciples of Christ, how, what it means to grow in Christ-likeness. And that is why we hope for everyone in our church to be able to pledge in giving. And not so much for the finances of the church, yes, that's a, certainly a part of it, but more importantly that by pledging, God is using our act of faith in pledging to help us to grow as His disciples more and more. And that's our hope as a church, that all of us will grow to be disciples who can fully trust in Him, in knowing how He loves us, He knows us, and He will provide for us. It's a bit like how, in closing, let me share of a missionary in Cambodia, Li Diang, who has been serving there for many years, over 30 years. Recently, she has retired. Uh, in the time when she was in Cambodia, she saved up some money and purchased a Cambodian flat that you can see on the screen. And that Cambodian flat, she bought with her own savings. And now she's using the rental that is generated from the renting out of the Cambodian flat to give to others. All that she receives in rental fees, she's using it to bless another ministry. She's using it to give to others. She's giving sacrificially. She's giving all that she receives from the rent to give for the sake of others. She's giving generously in her sacrificial giving for others. And that has inspired me to also think about giving sacrificially for the sake of others as well. Will you give? Because in giving, it will help us all to grow in generosity. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you, first, that you gave so generously for us. We are recipients of your sacrificial giving. You gave of your Son. We thank you also that your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, gave sacrificially his own life for us. Lord, help us to also be willing to give sacrificially for the sake of others. And in so doing, grow to be more Christ-like in turning the attention away from ourselves onto the needs of others and thereby growing in generosity. So help us, Lord, to give generously. And as we do so, we are growing furthermore in generosity more and more in our lives. And so we thank you. We commend our giving to you, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.